Hey everyone, my name is Iman Chaudhry. And my name is Danielle Solish, and today you're listening to the 27th episode of Seeing Clearly, which is a pre clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology. Today we are very excited to be interviewing Dr. Radha Kohli. So a little bit about Dr. Kohli. Uh, Dr. Kohli is a fellowship trained medical retina specialist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center and at the Kensington Eye Institute. She's an associate professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences at the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Coley obtained her fellowship in medical retina from Moorfields Eye Hospital in London, England, after completing her residency in ophthalmology at the University of Toronto. And prior to medical school at McMaster University, she obtained her PhD in visual psychophysics. Dr. Coley has a very broad medical retina practice, which includes screening and treatment of retinopathy of prematurity, diagnosing inherited retinal diseases, and also performing pneumatic retinopexies. She contributes significantly to teaching medical retina and cataract surgery to residents. Her research portfolio is growing, and most recently, she's focusing on sex disparities across a variety of different measures in ophthalmology. She's the vice chair for the Faculty of Development, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Wellness at Dobbs at U of T, and she is also a doting mother to four children between the ages of six and 14. So without further ado, we'd love to introduce Dr. Coley. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here, Iman and Danielle. It's uh, our pleasure to have you and thank you so much for joining us with your busy schedule. I guess we'll we'll jump right into our first question here, which we start out with all of our guests, but could you talk a little bit about your journey to ophthalmology? Yeah, so I, I have to say, I uh, you know, my journey to ophthalmology was uh, a circuitous one and a lucky one. Um, and I, I kind of, it's a journey that begins much before I started ophthalmology, but without going into too much detail, you know, I had a very traumatic childhood, I would say. And um, the result of that was that there wasn't a lot of planning for my future. Um, it was sort of, you know, I had to figure things out on my own. And so early on, I went, I auditioned for an art school in high school and wanted to be a dancer. And I would say that probably the only restriction I've ever had, um, well, maybe two restrictions I had by my mother was one, you know, do well in school, which I didn't always do. And university was a, uh, uh, like a not option. Like I had to go, there was no other <laughs> option. And so when I, I love dancing um, and I joined, a, we, I was part of a dance group that traveled all over Ontario and we danced for social change. And there was, just as there is now, you know, you look back and think things haven't changed since the mid nineties and even before, but there was, you know, police brutality against minorities. And we danced and performed, reenacted these things and danced on them and danced for social change. And so when I was told I wasn't allowed to go to New York, like some of my close friends, I landed up at Queens for undergrad. And, you know, my brother picked my courses in first year. Cause I was like, I don't want to be, so I, I was a political science and economics major. And I took psychology and he, he was like, don't take psychology, it's bogus and I love psychology. So in my second year, I majored in psychology um, and slowly figured out through that process that I loved the science of psychology. So neuroscience and cognitive science. And my final year I presented at a conference of the Mathematical and Psychology Association. And I thought, oh, I love research. Why don't I pursue this? And really, again, there was no strict strategy and discussing over the years, like, where are you going to go? It was just me following my nose and what opportunities sort of presented themselves in front of me. And so I decided to go to grad school and I did my math. So I ended up at York in a vision science program. I applied to all sorts of programs in psychology. And my professor was a British uh, physicist. And like the first year of my master's, I didn't like, he's a mathematician. And I like, I didn't even know what he was talking about the first year. <laughs> like it was all Fourier analysis and I had to learn the math and it was hard. Um, uh, and then in the second year I started doing projects and I really, we really bonded actually. And so he had suggested that I do my doctorate, which I did. Um, um, and in pursuing that, I realized I didn't wasn't really loving what I was doing. I loved coming up with questions. I love being creative. Um, and so coming up with research questions was, was really fun. But sitting in the lab and actually pulling the data, like you have to sit and push bus buttons, it's visual psychophysics. And I would be in a dark room and I was just thinking, could I do this for my whole life? And so I decided to apply to medical school. And I applied to one medical school, McMaster, because I hadn't done all the sciences. 
And then I got in and I spent a lot of my time in medical school, very insecure. I think that's when I started my imposter syndrome. This might be way too much information. So cut me off, but it does lead to ophthalmology, you know, because I felt like everyone had their sciences and I didn't like I knew how to do research, but I didn't know a lot of the basics. But Mac was a different kind of medical school. It was problem based. You didn't you learned what you needed to learn based on the problem. So I was lucky to be there. And it ended up being a great time in my life. And I wanted to be that doctor. Like I was also caught up in what if a family member calls me and they think, oh, she's not a real doctor. She went to Mac or whatever, you know, and I wanted. So I really was caught up in, in my elective time and doing stuff like family medicine and internal medicine. I wanted to be that doctor who, when someone called and said they had whatever problem, I could help them. Um, and then in my last year, I was dating someone actually, whose mother was a doctor. And she said, why don't you just put ophthalmology first? Just because, and I had done electives, uh, many electives and different things, but I had done six weeks in ophthalmology, one month at Toronto, where my preceptor was away the whole month. So I ended up doing more neurology than neuro-ophthalmology. So I didn't get that much exposure. And I did two weeks in plastics with uh, Dr. Nijawan and Dr. John Harvey at McMaster. And I really liked it, but two weeks wasn't a lot of exposure. And so I knew I needed to be in Toronto. I would needed to be close to my mother. And so I applied to a bunch of programs in Toronto and I put ophthalmology first. And I was lucky. I had a PhD. I had published five papers that were in big journals and I somehow got in and really it was luck. I mean, I think if I applied today, um, I wouldn't have gotten in because I didn't have, I've never planned, as I said, starting out with my childhood, you know, I sort of, there was never discussions on where are you going? What are your interests? What do you love? I just sort of followed my nose. And so um, um, I did the same thing here. She said, put it down first. So I put it down first and, you know, other people accepted different schools and I ended up in ophthalmology. So I am a bit, it was a circuitous path because I had done a doctorate beforehand, um, before medical school, but it was also very lucky. It was just that cohort that year um, that I got accepted, uh, you know, into it. And, and I feel very lucky that I've, I've had the opportunity to pursue a career in ophthalmology. No, that's awesome. It's also incredible to hear that you started off as a dancer and then you went to university and made this whole path. But also you bring up like really important points about imposter syndrome and just being afraid and not knowing what to do and what are other people going to think of you depending on what you do. And I think that's something we don't often talk about on the podcast and is extremely relevant. Um, so thank you for sharing all of that. Now, just a follow-up question to what you had just talked about in terms of how you reached ophthalmology, but can you now talk a little bit about your journey in ophthalmology? Yeah, so again, I had more, my imposter syndrome worsened in ophthalmology because again, I was with people who had known they wanted ophthalmology for a long time. So I started off really weak. I didn't have the background clinical knowledge or medical knowledge, um, but I learned quickly. I think, uh, you know, I'm a I'm quick at adapting and um, in my Fourth year, I met another resident, uh, Rajiv Mooney, who you may know, and we got, we fell in love and uh, we got married and we had a baby. And so that kind of, you know, I'd never pictured myself again, getting married or even having children. So uh, at that point, you know, I started thinking, oh, I like medical retina. I like, I like cataract surgery. I like the rare Ill illnesses in medical retina. So I decided to pursue a fellowship in ophthalmology. And at that time, before going for fellowship, you know, I was discussing um, what I was going to do when I come back, which is what you do in the final years of your residency. And Sunnybrook and St. Mike's were sort of on the table and Sunnybrook kind of followed through, through more. So I ended up at Sunnybrook. And, you know, here I was, I had done a PhD, but I was appointed as an academic physician and I didn't identify as one. I was like, I had more imposter syndrome, like, oh my God, how am I going to, what am I going to do? And again, I had no plan. I had to, first I had a baby and then I had three more babies uh, in practice. Um, and my first few years were really gaining confidence in my clinical um, in clinical medicine and just establishing a practice because that was hard too, managing staff and figuring out how to book patients and all of that stuff was very hard because um, you don't really get any guidance on it. You just sort of have to figure it out yourself. And then in that journey of those 10 years, you know, I was raising my kids um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to pursue again. So I did different things. I did an education scholars program for two years. I did a leadership program. I kept, and then I started, I realized I loved, again, the creative piece. And so 
I just uh, uh, created a TED course for ophthalmology. And the idea was that the traditional lecture, you know, you sit the traditional conference lecture, you're in a dark room, there's someone at a podium reading their slides. Are you looking at them? Are you reading what they're saying? Are you listening to them? It's freezing cold. Half the time you're checking your messages. Like, like it wasn't very effective learning. And most of the time you're at conferences really to mingle and to, and to meet people um, and discuss your ideas rather than the talks that are given at conferences. And so I thought a TED style would be more conducive to actually learning what you need to know through storytelling. Um, and in doing that, um, I really discovered that I love doing things kind of outside the box in ophthalmology. Um, and then I got asked to be chair, a ch a chair, vice chair, or God, not God, not chair, vice chair in our department. And again, I didn't know that I wanted this and I still don't know if I want it. I find leadership very hard. Um, but, uh, you know, it was sort of asked upon me, can you do something? Can you do this? And so I ended up doing leadership and also doing these creative professional activities like the, the TED course. And then I took a fellowship, did a fellowship during COVID in journalism and really decide, decided that I loved writing. Um, and so on the side now, I do a little bit of freelance journalism. So the whole point is that created creativity from dancing all those years ago, like it all comes together, whatever path you take to all ophthalmology or to whatever specialty you do everything comes back together if you're naturally like artistic and creative it's going to find its way into whatever you do in your work because it's part of what you are or who you are you know and so again and I never had this path of, oh, I want to do leadership and, oh, I want to write. And it just sort of things fell in my way. I came across, you know, this fellowship in, for, for physicians and I thought, oh, my God, I'd love to do journalism in, in medicine. And so yeah, I just jumped in on that boat, you know. And so I think I think being open to what presents itself around you in your career and also Always, I mean, it's so hard to get into ophthalmology now that I think that the first few years of, you're sort of hung over from that process. And, you know, just like you said, Iman, uh, you know, you're nervous about what all that you have to learn, but you want to always be growing in your career and doing things differently, um, not necessarily better than anyone else, but differently and in tune and authentic to who you are. And I think if you if you pursue your career with those uh, with that kind of perspective, you'll have a much broader and fuller career because you can you know you can do research you can do journalism you can do all sorts of things you can do education you can there's so many things that you can do within the field of ophthalmology innovation it keeps going um and i think if you keep your mind open rather than just getting on this train of um only doing one thing um it's it makes it for a much more fulfilling career and i think more recently now you know they say women have a double hump in their double hump in their career so we start out strong and then we have this sort of middle years where we're raising kids and taking care of parents and we our product productivity redu reduces and then we have a second spike and um, I think that I'm starting to dabble in research now more and looking at, Danielle, we've done quite a bit of work on sex disparities in ophthalmology. And so everything will come in time if uh, if we're lucky enough to live long enough to, and have a fulfilling career. All the things you want to do, you can fit in in your career if you um, just allow yourself to go through the stage that you're in, knowing that more is to come. So, you know, the studies show that at 30 years, the impact factor of research done by women finally supersedes men but unfortunately it takes us 30 years to get there so maybe when I'm whatever however old so but at least it's coming <laughs> so you know you just have to keep open to all the opportunities that uh, your career brings you well thank you so much for sharing all that it's incredible to see how you've merged all of those interests that you've had from such a young age till now uh, we don't really get to see, uh, you know, many academic uh, ophthalmologists or physicians in general talk about how they've been able to merge interests like that. So that's really incredible to see. And you you mentioned a little bit about being specifically a female in ophthalmology. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit more and, and your experience, you know, what has it been like to be a female in ophthalmology? And are there any challenges that you've experienced or have had to overcome by being a female in, in ophthalmology? Well, you know, I mean, I feel like I feel very lucky. I've never felt for the most part of my life, I've never felt, um, you know, that my race or my gender or my ethnicity um, have been, um, although I've, I've, I've had those issues in some way, or maybe imposter syndrome is more experienced in females. I keep coming up with that. It's clearly something 
something I've always had to battle. Um, but I don't feel as a female ophthalmologist that I've been in any way not given opportunities that my male counterparts have, with one exception, and I think that's in operating room time. And I don't blame anyone for that because the way the system is, is you know, operating time gets handed down and it's kind of grandfathered in. And sometimes um, you know, it's hard to take time away from one person and give to another. But the truth is in surgery, OR time is the most coveted resource. And uh, as Danielle and I know, uh, we won't uh, leak out our data, but in looking at OR distribution by uh, gender, uh, or rather by sex, there is a discrepancy. And I have to say that I have felt that in my career, that I have always wished to have more OR time. And I started out with no OR time and had to go uh, out quite far, like, you know, very pregnant <laughs> and uh, both second and third pregnancies um, and doing call in new market, which is far from where I am and, and serving a catchment that's far. Um, but I did whatever I had to do to get OR time, but I, you know, it's took a while and then it was one day a month and then it was a day and a half a month. And finally now it's two days a month. And I'm most grateful for that. But I think if I compared myself to my male counterparts, they probably had more OR time from the get go. And that is a problem. And it's something that we have to change slowly and really it begs the question of how is OR time distributed like who gets what and why um and so I you know I would say if I had to pick anything that would probably an area that uh, I've experienced a little bit of feeling that my uh being female has been a little bit of a disadvantage but it could also be the system itself too and just the way OR time is distributed it may not be specific to being female so it's hard to say yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's great that you acknowledge at the beginning that you feel like maybe, especially compared to other surgical specialties, there are less challenges. But of course, as we know from our research, operating time is something that there is a clear discrepancy. And um, we're excited to eventually release that research in the future. Um, but speaking of things that we've done together, um, we know that we've together been awarded a medical humanities grant for our work on becoming a micro revolutionary, which was this term that you mostly had coined yourself. And I was wondering if you could talk to our audience, because I don't think a lot of our audience members are aware of this at all, and just the work you're doing with microaggressions in general, and what you hope to achieve through this work. Yeah, so this is work that Danielle, you and I and Marco Popovich, Dr. Popovich have worked on, and it's really a joint labor of love, I would like to say, I hope you feel the same way. Um, and we've looked at, you know, questions that are important if you're ever, you know, looking at research and what you want to do is the why and the how, those are the questions that are the ones that tend to be most important and most interesting. Um, and so, you know, I was doing it with a couple of other medical students. Uh, we were doing a systematic review. I should mention them, Isra Hussein and Nikki Rusta, just to give them full credit on um, on sex disparities uh, uh, in ophthalmology. And in doing that, we came across a paper on bystander training to harassment um, and micro micro macro aggressions. And there was a workshop in that. And I thought, oh, this would be really interesting to do in ophthalmology. And they did have, um, and so then from there, Danielle, you, Marco, and I flew with it, you know, and the 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 how of managing microaggressions, although we've worked hard on our um, acronym and our algorithm, isn't the most interesting part, I feel there are many hows as I've spoken to, you know, people in surgery and medicine about uh, us presenting our rounds, there are many acronyms or algorithms um, out there on what to do when you're faced with a micro or even macro aggression. Even something as simple as saying, pardon me, you know, is a, can make people stop and think. It doesn't have to be this extensive but the why, why do we stand up uh, when we have experienced slights on an, any level is really interesting. And I think um, I think when we figure out our why, we figure out our purpose or you know our North Star, if I can sound kind of cheesy, um, then we're more willing to stand up for things. Um, and so if we understand that, you know, for me, you know, it's very important to achieve sex parity in, in ophthalmology. If I have that purpose and that drive, then when I see injustices around that, I have a greater need to sort of fix that issue. And then I, I'm more inclined to stand up and challenge microaggressions in that domain. And I think the bigger thing is when you have purpose and when you uh, understand when injustices are happening, 
And if you have the strength and can take the risk to stand up for them, it's one antidote to burnout. So we know physicians, healthcare providers are so burnt out and more now than ever, the numbers are striking. And there are many etiologies for this burnout and there are many treatments, if you will, treatments or ways to change things to help um, prevent burnout. And those are individual and system and you know everything in between. But I think when you, um, I think when you have a cause or when you see something being done that isn't right and you fight for it, it's invigorating and it makes you feel um, alive and it makes you feel very dedicated. And when you have that, I, I think that that's an antidote to feeling burnt out and taking all these, um, you know, slants that are put against you and just swallowing them when there's no way to sort of find a way to control and make change. That's a recipe for, you know, becoming, less compassionate, having emotional fatigue. So anyway, my whole point is to say that when you have when you're when you have purpose, it's much easier to take the risk of um, uh, standing up to microaggressions. And I think that's the piece that's the micro revolutionary. I'm, I'm, we're not asking people to protest and we're not asking people to be rebels, but we're asking people to stand up to injustices that are either individual or group or even larger based. And in so doing, you know, one person doing it sets an example and empowers others to do it. And it's like an, it's like an epidemic. Um, it can spread and cause a change that's greater on a systems level um, and have a positive lasting uh, impact. So that's our workshop on, on sort of training people how with an uh, algorithm that we've come up with, but also, inspiring people to know their why so that they can become micro revolutionaries in their own journeys in medicine. For sure. And I know I can speak for myself and I'm sure Iman as well, but there are situations where we'll be in as medical students where there might be a microaggression or slight made either towards us or something that we witness. And I think it's very easy to, to do nothing about it because, you know, you might be too afraid to respond or you don't have the time to respond, but really this workshop is all about you know, how do you empower yourself and how do you empower others to, to make that change and, and to make that small difference? And even if it's that small first step, then that's what's becoming a micro-revolutionary in general. And, and, you know, we all have power. Every single human being has power. You have a voice and it carries weight. And that's that holds in medicine too, whether you're a medical student, or, you know, you often can feel unseen in the training process uh, and you're going from one, you know, rotation to another and you're in and out and no one really knows your story and your journey, but you guys as medical students, as residents, as fellows, all trainees and, and staff too, everybody has personal power. And so knowing when and how to use it and why you're using it is really important to kind of, you know, bring our system and our fields to a more, you know, equitable and diverse and inclusive sort of state. And so thank you both for, for your work on this project. You know, it's one thing to see an injustice and then another to act on it and to try and make a change in, you know, your your city or for both of you, the rest of the country. So thank you both for, for doing that. And like you mentioned, Dr. Coley, you work a lot with learners. And so kind of taking um, a turn on, in the interview, I was wondering if you may be able to talk a little bit more about that and any advice that you have for our learners and students interested in ophthalmology or in medicine in general. We have a lot of learners that listen to the podcast, so I'm sure they'd really appreciate it. So, I mean, advice is always hard, you know, like you, we all learn by going through life. Um, and so advice is, you know, just that it's just advice. Um, but I think there's a few things. I think the harder thing I, I'd like to tell learners who are interested in ophthalmology is, you know, always have a plan B. Ophthalmology is amazing, but there are other amazing areas in medicine. And if you put all your eggs ever in one basket, it, you risk, you know, we always have to diversify our investments. If I, again, can sound a little cheesy, but, you know, it's important to not, even when you're in ophthalmology, not to just only think in one way, like, you know, you have to keep an open mind and be open to what life presents you because life will always present you things. And if you're aware and in tune, um, those are all often opportunities that may not come around again. So be open, have a backup plan for people who are uh, medical at the medical student stage. And, and in general, for medical students, residents, and anyone else who's listening, I think um, being creative, like never lose your creative side um, in your work. I think it's something that really uh, um, makes you feel excited. And it's very important to 
you know, not just replicate and go through the motions in life or cut and paste from one area to another. So I would say have an open mind and have a creative mind in your journey in medicine. Thank you. And it's, I'm sure for everyone who's listened to this whole podcast, it just shows like, you might look at someone like you read your bio and be like, wow, such an impressive person, but no one actually thinks about, you know, the whole journey and the whole story to get there and like where you tie your past creativity and put it back into where you are now. And it, it doesn't all just come into peace all at once. Like it takes, it's a long process and it's a long journey. It's important for all learners to really, like you said, go through the motions of that. Mm-hmm. And when Joel- Stage. Enjoy each stage. Sorry, carry on uh, to finish. But yeah, enjoy each stage of the process. It's so easy to be anxious in medicine. I'll just make this last point, you know, getting into medical school, getting into residency, getting your fellowship, getting your job, then setting up your job. And then like, you know, and it, it actually, before you know it, you're like, turn around, you're 65. You're like, I just have generalized anxiety disorder. Cause it's like, I'm anxious about now my kids or my grandkids, like it doesn't end, you know? And so stop and smell the roses too, because all of you who are in medicine are so lucky. We're so lucky to practice any sort of medicine in Canada and to practice medicine in general. It's like, we're helping people. We're really, really, really lucky. So smell the roses too. Thank you so much for those words of wisdom. You know, I think as medical students, especially we get sidetracked and are just so focused on getting to that next step. So it's, it's really valuable to hear that advice. Uh, And on that note, we've kind of wrapped up our ophthalmology and medicine related questions. And as our uh, listeners know, we now move into our would you rather segment to get to know you a little bit better and to just have a bit of fun. Um, So I'll start out with the first question here. Uh, which is, would you rather be able to travel anywhere for free or eat anywhere for free? I'll eat for sure. I travel in my head. I don't need to travel, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. Eat, easy one. You can go yeah. to all the best restaurants and eat for free. It'd be nice. Um, I have kids, but it does get easier again. So. <laughs> Um, and then my question may be a bit harder. We'll see. Would you rather have a pause button or a rewind button on your life? Ooh, hmm. that's really interesting. Uh, they're both interesting. Um, um, I think I would rather at the, there were many years where I wished for a rewind button and it took me a long time to really let go of things from the past. And it's hard to do, you know, we can feel hard done by, or we can carry our luggage, you know, it's like just one minute and I have my six suitcases. This is my mom. This is my dad. This is my blah, you know, whatever, all your, all your issues. Um, and so I often wanted to rewind, but now I would say I would definitely pause. Yeah, I like that. Very insightful. Um, and I guess with that, we've kind of wrapped up the episode. And so I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Cooley, for joining us. And thank you so much to our listeners for listening to this episode of Seeing Clearly, which is our pre-clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology. To stay caught up with everything else iCurriculum is doing, be sure to uh, check out our website at www.icurriculum.com and to follow us on social media at iCurriculum. Thank you again so much, Dr. Cooley, for joining us. It was a pleasure. What a joy. Thank you so much to both of you for all you're doing.